Good morning, everyone. This is my second Zoominar, so please bear, bear with me and us. I'd like to welcome you this morning to the second lecture of the uh, Nora series. And today we're going to start off um, by introducing everybody who will be speaking to you this morning, and then I'll give you a little bit of overview of um, what the next hour will, will be like. Okay, so shall we start in Sweden? Yes, hello everybody. I'm Katrin Johansson. I'm professor in Mid-Sweden University and in the background you can see our campus and it's almost as bright as sunny in the picture as it is today. And we also have in the webinar uh, Ulrika Hauge from DNV. Hi, my name is Ulrika Haugen. I'm Chief Communications Officer for DNV GL. We are a quality assurance and risk management company. And then we also have Josephine Edvall from ACT with us today. Hi everyone, I'm happy to join. I'm Senior Vice President of Communication for Hygiene and Health Company ACT. Uh, where this topic is so relevant. So I am thrilled to join here today. And I am Peggy Brum, and I'm a Professor Emerita here at BI, and uh, still keeping my hand in, in my most favorite subjects, communication and social responsibility. Now this morning, we're going to start by uh, Katrin, uh, giving an overview of the results uh, regarding this uh, subject from the Environmental Communication Monitor, the Environmental Communication Monitor, the uh, European Communication Monitor. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what is sustainability and social responsibility. And then we'll ask our two guests, uh, one from Norway and one from Sweden, to talk about what they are doing in their own firm, DNV, GL, and ESITI. But for right now, um, I'd like to say welcome, Katrin, if you could tell us about um, the 2020 results in this area. Yes. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, but it doesn't look like maybe I should share this. Yeah. Can you see my screen coming on now? Yes. Right. So um, we know that uh, sustainable development and CSR have been in the focus in both private and organizations, business organizations and, and public organizations for a long time. But also in research, there is increasing communication research on sustainable development and CSR. So a very recent case study showed that communication employees perceive that CSR is obligatory, rarely questions are explained and mainly provided for good press due to its philanthropic focus. That was a case study in one organization. But uh, we also know that communication is a factor to begin and keep proper sustainable development strategy. And I'm really happy to, uh, to have both cases from SET and DNV with us in this webinar today, because we are going to hear a lot more about how you are working with CSR and sustainable development. But I'm first going to share with you some, uh, some slides from and results from the European Communication Monitor. And if you're not familiar with the European Communication Monitor, it is a study that is conducted annually and uh, there is a report published every year and now the 2020 report was just recently published uh, before the summer and uh, this report is based from over 2300 communication professionals in europe and uh, uh, the report this year it takes up ethical challenges gender issues cyber security competence gaps and but also uh, what communication professionals perceive as the most strategic issues during the coming years. And that is what we are going to talk about today, because one of the top important strategic issues for communication management is actually sustainable development and social responsibility. As you can see, as the results from the European Communication Monitor, 
this is the second rank, the second most important topic. And uh, it was able to pick three uh, important topics in this survey. So as you can see, uh, building and maintaining trust was uh, perceived as most important strategic issues by 41 uh, percent of the respondents and sustainable development social responsibility goes over 35 percent 37.5 percent and then other important uh, issues are also uh, uh, dealing with the speed and volume of inf information flow strengthening the role of the communication function in supporting top management decision making using big data algorithms and so on so uh, we're going to see also that uh, sustainable development and social responsibility is ranked very high right now, but it has not always been the case. And this uh, slide shows a little bit the development of how these strategic issues were perceived over the years. So you can see uh, uh, in 2007, there were three important strategic issues. The orange line is coping with the digital evolution and the social web. And you can see that that line has a real peak around 2010, 2011, when social media uh, first um, was de developed and started to being employed. And now it's dropped. The other important subject in, in 2007 was building and maintaining trust. And that has been relatively stable uh, and is now on the top uh, uh, in 2020. And the third one was linking business strategy and communication and that was really important from the beginning but it also has dropped a little bit because I think that has already be, been implemented now in, in many organizations. And then the green line shows the sustainable development of social responsibility. And in 2008, you remember the financial crisis was in 2009. And we were asking ourselves, is it now then when, when we have a real crisis that these issues pop up? Because there has been a drop in sustainable development and, and social responsibility. Uh, how you think about it as a strategic issue. You can also see in this picture that our new subjects turning up um, in 2012 uh, matching the need to address more audience as a channels with, channels with limited resources and the gray line strengthening the role of the communication function in supporting top management decision making and then also in 2016 we had this big data and algorithm turning up as an important strategic issue so uh, what explains this, this drop? Uh, we have a picture here of, of Greta Thunberg uh, with her strike from school for the climate. And we see right now uh, that there is a very big interest from both the general public, but also in public and, and private organizations to work with sustainability. And we have enormous challenges. And this data, as you should think about was published now in June, but it was collected uh, before the COVID crisis and, and the Corona outbreak. So that might also uh, in the next survey affect these figures about the strategic issues, of course. And uh, we can see also that building and maintaining trust is really high and has been relatively stable, as I said before. Um, so, uh, we were thinking about what this figure show and if there is a difference in companies, governmental organizations and nonprofits, consultancies and agencies. And there is a little bit of a difference. Uh, so uh, in governmental organizations, as you can see the orange line, it's more important about working with trust uh, and the sustainable development of social responsibility responsibility had a, a relatively little bit uh, lower fi figures uh, and in, in companies you can see that sustainable development and social responsibility is really important uh, and uh, in nonprofits as well uh, it's very high, highly ranked so there are a little bit differences here and we have also uh, been uh, 
singling out the results uh, from the Nordic countries, which was also a little bit different because sometimes we think that the Nordic countries are very, very similar. <laughs> um, and Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, we are, we are almost the same. But there are uh, a little bit of differences uh, when you look at the Nordic perspective. If you see uh, in all countries that we had 37.5 for sustainability and social responsibility and 41.6 for building and earning trust, you can see that there are some differences. Uh, and in this case, actually Sweden sticks <laughs> is, um, has a very low figure compared to the other Nordic countries with 29% thought that sustainability and social responsibility was a strategic issue. Uh, whereas the trust uh, has a, a higher figure over 50% uh, and the other countries are a little bit <clears throat> uh, more similar. But as a sum, uh, we can see from these results that uh, it is very important to the respondents to work with building trust and building trust also is based on fulfilling expectations created by promises made from organizations on how they see their role and particularly when it comes to environment society and governance and these issues are really important in the future and fulfilling expectations also requires linking business strategy and communication and the strength and the strategic role of communication within organizations so uh, I think that you as a communicators has really important role in driving the work in your organizations towards sustainable development and work with CSR. And um, uh, I, I will now hand over to Peggy Brown, who will continue and talk about some important new issues. Peggy. Thank you very much, Katrin. But, uh... And as uh, we said last time, we're, these uh, concepts of um, sustainability and corporate responsibility, they're, they've been out there for a long time and for a while, but they're two complicated concepts that have a lot of different definitions. So what I'm going to try and do is talk a little way through it and uh, see where we are. And I've sort of come to the conclusion that there are two sides of the same coin. One is commitment and the other one is action. And communication is an imperative when it comes to what organizations are doing in, in these areas. So sustainability, to me, that is the uh, action, if, if you will. It's what organizations are doing to meet um, their own needs but to make sure future generations are, are still here, the planet's still here, if you will. And it's recognized to be made up of the three pillars of economy, society, and the environment, sometimes called profit people and the planet. Now, again, there's a lot of discussion around this. That some of these definitions are old. They need to be updated, a better recognition of the times we live in, et, et cetera. Um, corporate responsibility for me, then, is the commitment. So you are committed to managing these things for the future, if you will. And nowadays we talk about ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance. So these are things that are sort of working their way through different societies. And of course, we have to make sure that we talk about you know, the West versus the East, South versus the North, et cetera. I came across a really neat little article, um, and this is how these authors sort of view um, how how we can transition from say for to say to sustainability for all life on Earth, where you're not just thinking about yourself, right? But everybody benefits from what we're doing as, as organizations. And they break it down into what they call drivers and hinders. So what, what, what can help sustainability go forward and what will stop it if we don't change the way we do things. And if you look at the sort of center thing, harmony, enlightenment, uh, sustainability for life, it includes communication, campaigns, direct action, education, you know, delivering, you know, sort of at the deliberative forums, et cetera. 
And all of these things can be done by organizations and are being done by many organizations, right? So, and a, like I said, a big part of this is communication and doing campaigns. Now, in the literature, there is this idea of what we call the implicit approach and the explicit or principle-based approach to communication. The implicit approach is more or less um, writing reports, worrying about you know these various uh, environmentally friendly scales that you can be on, etc. And it's not as strategic as the explicit or principle-based approach, which calls for more communication by an organization uh, talking about itself and what it's doing. And of course, that demands that you're actually doing it because you must have evidence. But it's more sort of vision oriented. It's in the strategy of the organization. It, Etc. And part of this has to do with the values that an organization sees itself as happening. So I came across another very interesting little article, um, and it's sort of this idea of rhetoric versus reality. And when it comes to culture, and uh, part of the values of who you are as part of your culture, does your company walk the talk? And the the, the author saying company practices often conflict with corporate values, and closing that gap starts with communication. And they did a survey, and they found out, if you can see on, on the left side, um, the sorts of values that the firms that they surveyed had, and these are large Fortune 500 firms, et cetera. Integrity was the most common. It was listed by 65% of the firms, and that was followed by, um, you know, sort of customer focus and, uh, I can't see it's all about, yeah, oops, sorry, something, something happened there. But what's interesting about this, they said 73% of companies have three to seven values. And if you look at this list, only 29% listed social responsibility as a value or accountability. These were not a value statement of the organization. And trust, only 17% had trust as a value. And people, was only 22%. So, I mean, you can ask how do you value, so we value our people, you know. So, so, so those are kind of interesting statistics, but not only that, so it, uh, what we also found out was that, um, I don't know where I'm supposed to point here, so it's not working, Oop. oh, there we go. Right. So more than 80%, you know, publish their corporate values, but they also found out there was no correlation between their values and the corporate culture. In other words, the employees did not believe the organization practiced what they preached. Uh, they didn't you know, discuss how they resonate with societal expectations, what sort of values society expects from these organizations, but it's a pretty bad indication when employees don't believe what their organizations are saying about them. And this is absolutely critical, because if you look at what happened this year, and it's like the COVID-19 virus just uncovered all these things that organizations had been doing for a long time in the case of Quaker Oats and Jemima and the pancake mix. Here you have a stereotype that is extremely offensive to part of the population. And why did this company all of a sudden realize it in 2020? And this year is actually the 100th anniversary of this brand, uh, this particular you know, product. So this is an iconic you know, sort of symbol for this company. And you know, it just sort of boggles my mind. Where was this person in this company that could stand up and say, you know, hello, maybe we should not be doing this. And if you look at, you know, Barbie has come out now with a line of dolls with different body types. Well, people have had different body types forever. So all of a sudden, they're recognizing that maybe this is something that they should think about. And in gay pride, and we can see this in companies jumping on the bandwagon. Where are their values when it comes to these issues, and can we find them with the organizations? So I have a little bit of advice for organizations this morning. And one is, don't wait for these issues to smack you upside the head, if you will. Okay? Start a system for you to identify them now. What is going on in society? Where does your organization fit 
with what is going on in society? What are you doing, you know, in that regard? And I would, today, I would check all of your messaging and all of your message sources, okay? Are there inconsistencies in your values and what you are saying and not the least what you are doing, all right? So somebody is probably dropping the ball someplace along the line of your communication, all of your communication, and in particular your marketing communication. Because in my experience, that tends to be the area where the errors happen, if you will. So these values, they need to be actionable, distinctive for you, how you define, we all have similar values, but what they mean for you as an organization specifically, okay, and link them to the results of your organization. Okay. And you have to open up for listening okay, and input for stakeholders. And I mean really open up, not just say you do it, not have, you know, sort of social media, uh, Facebook kind of stuff, you know. It has to be, in, I, I was going to say in person, but that doesn't work nowadays, but when you can, in person, face to face, as close as possibly as you can get. Okay. And you have to provide evidence that you are listening to them, and those have to be action action items, right? Because then they can see that you are listening to them because you're doing things, maybe something that they suggest that you do, okay? And you have to be in a position as a communication professional to talk to your organizations and to have influence with the decision makers because you're the one that is not necessarily creating these uh, relationships with the stakeholders, but you are the one that's monitoring that they're good and healthy relationships, if you will. Okay? So at the, play the devil's advocate. Well, what do you think somebody will say about that? Well, how do you think that will be received in the marketplace, you know, et cetera? So really play the devil's advocates. But I came across an um, uh, uh, interesting um, conversation I was having with somebody. And they made the statement to me, which is in Norwegian, uh, discussion of hvor mye bekraft og omdomme generelt betyr for salge. And my first reaction was like, what does that mean? Does that mean that you won't do it unless it impacts sales? Or you will do it because you really mean that it needs to be done, etc. And you are environmentally friendly, you are following all these things. But if you give the impression that you're only doing it for sales, right, so you're really not operating in this sort of extended fear, right, where you're doing it because it's a desirable or expected thing to do, right? You're sort of operating on the bottom. You're doing it because you have to do it. Right? And there's a lot of that, you know, so, but there's, there's no reputation to be gained, if you will, from that sort of thinking. So companies need to move away from this idea that sustain, trying to correlate sustainability and social responsibility with sales or financial performance. And I'll admit, I did that very early in my career when I was working with social responsibility because if we could demonstrate that it impacted sales, right, then they would do it, but only if it was profitable, all right? So, but that was very early when people were starting to think about it, and this was, you know, the Milton Friedman, the business, the business, the business, right, that, that sort of thinking. You cannot, you know, survive in the marketplace for very long with that kind of thinking, not with the activism that's going on today, okay? So there's not really a conflict of the survival of a firm versus survival of the planet. These things are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so your job then as communication people is convincing management of what's going on out there and what their role needs to be and convincing society that you're really doing something about it, all right? So I'd like to leave it there, except for one statement. So, it's, uh, so this is why I believe that, you know, what you want from your stakeholders, of course, are su support and different kinds of things depending on your stakeholders. They want to know what you're doing. So communication becomes an organizational imperative. All right. So now I'm happy to hear from some practitioners, some uh, communication executives uh, in Sweden and Norway, and what they're doing. And we'll start first with Ulrika Hauge at the DNVGL. I can't say it in English anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. Let me see if I can share my screen. 
Oh. I hope you can all see my screen. So I'll tell you a little bit about how sustainability fits with DNVGL. Uh, DNVGL, just a brief introduction uh, because it's not only difficult to pronounce but also not that easy to explain what we do. Uh, but we are a company of 12,000 employees in over 100 countries that has worked uh, with quality assurance and risk management for over 150 years. So put it in simple terms, we've been uh, certifying ships. Uh, we are today much broader than that. Uh, we are advising uh, the energy sector, including renewables, uh, ensuring that uh, windmills are uh, built in the right way and uh, are also in a lot of other industry sectors like food and beverage, automotive and so on. Um, to start with, I wanted to share with you our purpose and our vision. And that is because Peggy talked a lot about that, uh, you know, the values really need to fit to the culture and it can't be something artificially created. Uh, and what is surprising at DNVGL is that the purpose is really part of the DNA. We've had the purpose of safeguarding life, property and the environment since the beginning of the company for of over 150 years. And I've only been with the company for three years, but what is impressive is you can ask any of the 12,000 uh, employees around the world and people know the purpose by heart. So it's really lived. Uh, the vision is something that we develop, uh, you know, um, every 10 to 15 years. And it of course needs to fit to uh, to uh, uh, a strategy and a current CEO, so a trusted voice to tackle global transformations and sustainability, of course, is very much a you know part of a global transformation uh, is is our basis. But uh, why does sustainability need to be an integral part of our strategy? Not only because I was in a meeting with KPMG, our auditors last week, and they pushed very much to have it as an integral part of the, the, the strategy, but it need, it, the purpose is one reason. Our customers are starting to expect uh, uh, you know, a sustainability focus. Employer branding, Gen Z wants to work for companies that make an impact, maintain strong position as a sustainability leader that we've built up over many years. Uh, society is expecting it and we have also signed up as a member for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and the UN Global Compact. And at last, even banks are asking for company sustainability uh, um, approach now to, to give uh, bank loans. Uh, this is a busy slide, but if you look at the very left, as part of our vision and values workshops last year, we asked our employees um, you know what they want the NBGL to focus on in the next 10 years and to address societal issues, make a difference and sustainability are the ones that really stand out. Um, we have uh, looked into which sustainable development goals can we as a company make the greatest impact on. Uh, it doesn't make sense to say, well, we can do everything to all the 17 SDGs, but I think it's important to, to limit it to the ones that you really can make an impact on. Uh, and, and we've uh, um, uh, selected uh, these uh, SDGs here, uh, and I'll show you kind of how they fit to the work that we do. Uh, when we come to communications, what can we do? We can position through research and thought leadership. Uh, so really walking the talk by what we do. On the left-hand side, you see that we work with a lot of research reports. Our biggest report is an over 300 page uh, energy transition outlook that we publish on, a, on an annual basis, similar to the International Energy Association. Uh, and, and that is really uh, you know, walking the talk, uh, helping companies to, um, uh, you know, do their uh, part in the energy transition if it is advising a ship owner on alternative fuels for the future or uh, an investor on which kind of renewable energy to invest in. Uh, uh, so, so that's on the energy transition outlook. Then sustainability reports. We've been a member of the UN Global Com Compact for uh, 20 years, so from it when it started, and the UN Global Compact has asked us several times to produce uh, um, reports, so to analyze the work they do. And the latest one was produced just before the summer, where we analyzed actually um, the effect that different industry sectors have made 
on the sustainable development goals. So really interesting to look into, uh, you know, how has the finance sector performed compared to the healthcare sector, food and beverage, what have these sectors done? So have a look at it afterwards. I don't want to do marketing here, but you know, it's, you, you might be curious to find out how sec your sector in general has been doing in terms of uh, uh, sustainability and implementing the SDGs. Then our business areas, they have various reports as well. And we have um, a group technology and research team. 5% of our annual revenue is invested uh, in, in uh, uh, innovation and, and research. Uh, and we use these research reports also to um, you know, communicate uh, about sustainability. Then we communicate through our products and services because there's a lot of products and services that actually support the SDGs directly. So we have, for instance, a carbon neutrality uh, protocol, which is in a way a regulation that helps uh, companies to, to um, become, become carbon neutral, which is a direct uh, support to uh, SDG 13 on climate action. Uh, another very recent one on the right hand side, we also uh, certify hospitals. Uh, we've got over 300 hospitals in the US that we have certified in terms of infection prevention. So when the pandemic hit, what we thought, well, you know, big area, big uh, that has challenges now is the cruise sector, passenger vessels. Uh, so we have uh, introduced uh, um, infection prevention programs for cruise vessels, and that goes directly into SDG 3, which is on good health and well-being and trust, by the way, as well. <laughs> uh, and lastly, communicating through campaigns. Uh, so I encourage my teams uh, in the different business areas to have campaigns so that we communicate with a strong message through all the communication channels that we have. So one example here, the impact of COVID-19 on the energy transition. The other one is a transition faster approach. This is just to show a few examples on what sustainability means for the NVGL and how we live it through uh, culture, through products and through communication. Thank you. I'll hand over to Josephine now. Thank you, uh, Ulrika. Very interesting. And thank you, Peggy, as well, because it liaises very much with the presentation I'm about to share with you. Uh, can you all see my screen? Perfect. Perfect. So, um, uh, as I said, I am from SET. It's a global hygiene and health company. And we were actually uh, split out from SCA, that was a forest and hygiene company uh, founded in 1929. So sustainability has been for a very long time core to our business. That's why I love my job. And also related to the hygiene part, of course, first when we had forest, it was very much people and nature. Uh, and then we brought that into SCT as well. Uh, and we really like to walk the talk, like you said, Peggy, and also what you said, Ulrike, because if you just say you support SDGs and sustainability is important, but you don't have any content, you don't have any proof points, and you don't have any KPIs, then you're out. Then you're out. So I thought I was going to share a little bit what we've done in our sustainability in brief, which talks very much about sustainability. And our company, we are based in 150 countries, and we have some 46,000 employees. And we realized very early that everybody in our company needs to be ambassadors related to sustainability and we need to have the whole management team on top of this they need to believe in this and they also need to realize that if we work and do good this will help sales so it goes hand in hand so when we're doing things it of course should help sales but it should also improve well-being well-being for people and well-being for nature so our vision, it is SET we're dedicated to improving well-being through leading hygiene and health solution. And we have divided that in three areas where we have 
well-being, uh, where we deal with very much social issues. For a very long time, we've been working on breaking taboos related menstruation, incontinence, and supporting women, uh, also doing more from less, supporting the environment, of course, and circularity. Uh, and I would say we were early on contributing to the environment with targets. We had sustainability report very early, and we have sustainability targets. No, you can actually go back. I have somebody helping me with the slides. <laughs> um, so, and we also look at the global trends because we always want to be one step ahead. So in communication, where for me as head of communication, sustainability is the most important vehicle, I would say, to support sales, but strengthen the perception and build trust. And then we need to provide proof points, like reports, like education. We do a lot of education about hygiene. Uh, we were actually first out with uh, educating about hand washing, uh, which is, a, as we all know, an extremely relevant topic today. Uh, and we work with partnerships. Because if you work together with somebody else, we believe also one and one can be more than two. And we are having partnership with the United Nations, different organs where we do either uh, programs like UNICEF in Mexico, where we started out supporting women. Because we found out that in Latin America, uh, nine out of ten women and girls are being harassed by their boyfriends, spouses, and so on. And this leads, of course, very much to our business. Uh, we sell feminine hygiene products, so we can link it to the products and to our competence. To our competence. And then you need to work with both girls and women uh, and boys. And then we included actually hand washing before COVID in schools, because you need to start there. So they can have proper hygiene in schools and that boys actually understand what it is when women and girls are menstruating. So that we help with our own people as volunteers together with UNICEF, that's one example. And then we have other example with United Nations Foundation where we drive the global dialogue. We bring our customers there and do workshops about sustainability, how we all can help and improve. And we measure everything. And I work very close to my colleagues in the management team, and all employees are ambassadors. So you also get that, that they are get proud about this, and for potential employees. Next slide. Uh, we have the target, as I said, because what gets measured gets done. And next. Uh, and here, our brand purpose is breaking barriers to well-being. Uh, so also want to work with the business where we actually have good solutions that help well-being for people. But then, of course, our products can help. So we are communication work close to the business. For example, some years ago, we realized when you go to a bathroom uh, at the hotel or an airport, restaurant, you just throw away the towels and they get you know, away. And we said, we must be able to do something with this. Circularity after use. Uh, can we do, can we recycle that? And we did that. We talked to the governments, we talked to the customers, and we developed the service. So we are now actually recycling the towels, making toilet paper. So we're doing in all these areas, and we communicate about it. We also walk the talk because I believe you need to use both your brain and your heart. Personally, I'm out in townships. In South Africa, I go to Mexico and meet with these young girls, with the young boys, and talk about issues. And with COVID came, we had uh, actually 
the government asked us and said, can you do something to help? And we were early out with COVID, already in January. Uh, I actually sat with the CEO and we said, we're going to care for our people. We're going to contribute to society and, of course, secure business success because we're not an NGO. But all these three, they're interlinked. So when we got the question if we could help, we were actually saying, maybe we can produce face masks. We had never done that before, but we were producing diapers and similar things. We were able to do this in rocket time, according all rules, according all rules. And then we deliver that in Sweden. First, non-profit, we don't make anything, we donated it. But now, of course, we're going to see if we can make money out of it. I have, I have to, to take, take some, some water. So to wrap up, <coughs> sustainability sees are more important than ever. And it's a fantastic tool for us as communicators. But you need to walk the talk. You need to have proof points. When you say you're doing good, you need to have the examples and show the outcome. And I think my eight minutes are out. So thank you so much. And now I think I was going to hand over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Josephine. Uh, and also congratulations to you for uh, receiving the communication prize in Sweden by the Swedish Communication Association this year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, and uh, I think that um, these are both Ulrike and Josephine have shown great examples of how business organizations can actually be uh, be active and lead the transformation of the society meeting these enormous challenges that we have lying ahead both with health issues with environmental issues and with governmental agency issues so we have uh, some time for questions now and uh, we have already received two questions but if you have other questions be feel free to post them in our questions and answers you see that in the bottom beneath the screen. Uh, I have also received some one question in the in the in, in the chat. But the first question is from Chard, <laughs> and it's an acronym for, for a name. I don't know who this is, but uh, the question is like this: It's surprising that social responsibility is rated lower than building trust. I think this was uh, to to the to the first slides of my presentation from the European Communication Monitor, and the question is: Are, are there other ways to build trust for organizations? And I think that um, if I can answer something myself first, that it's interesting that social responsibility is rated lower than building trust, but so working with so say, social responsibility. Uh, and sustainable yeah. development is of course a way also to create trust but i think there are of course other ways for organizations to build trust and josephine as you just yeah. told uh, the response mm -hmm. to the covid crisis mm -hmm. is one of those ways to build trust yeah. but do you have another answer to that i think the only thing i reacted when i saw this in the beginning i think they are liaised they are connected because you, you can't build trust. Today, it's not enough showing good figures. Uh, I also have investor relations, investor relations in my responsibility. And the last couple of years, the investors asked so many questions about gender and equality and about those things. So today, it's not enough anymore to have good figures. You need to do CSR and good sustainability. So for me, the two goes together. And if you, because if you do good thing, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ulrike, do you want to reply something to this yeah. question as well? Our vision, uh, you know, to be a trusted voice to tackle global transformations. So trust is at our very core. And I agree with Josephine and what you said that uh, that very much uh, goes in line with, uh, you know, the sustainability and uh, actually without trust, you know, I think you can't have a close 
customer centricity and actually generate revenue. If yes, just in. thank you. So Peggy, uh, yes, do you have something yeah, to add? Yeah, we all say that uh, tr trust is an outcome, you know, sort of, uh, you know, so you invest in a relationship and people can come back to you and they get what you promise them. Uh, so, you know, you sort of build up, you know, we said in, in the first thing, you know, you build up expectations and then you have to fulfill those expectations. And the more you fulfill them and constantly, then people start to trust you. So wanting to be trusted is an excellent uh, goal for uh, communication departments and for an organization. Thank you. And I must uh, uh, say, excuse me if to chart because <laughs> it says it's my real name. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yes, we have another question as well from Andy. Uh, how much is expected in this regard from countries? So is anyone uh, wanted to, like Russia, Russia and China is the add on to that question. Do you want to, to keep answering that, Peggy? How much is expected? So like yeah, I mean, we have some interesting conversations going on in Norway right now, and I get the question a lot, how is that going to impact Norway's reputation? And now we have, you know, some things going on with uh, investments, uh, who's going to be in charge of uh, the Norwegian, I can't remember what you call it, our, our big fund that the Norwegian government, uh, and a lot of that has to do with um, Norway has built itself up in this regard as only investing in ethical funds. Um, you know, where people are placing their money is really important to the Norwegian the government, etc. So these things are attached to two countries um, as part of who they are and part of their national identity. And we talk about, you know, this should be a Nordic alliance. And there is um, uh, a lot of Nordic um you know uh, initiatives in in this area you have the nordic uh, minister council of ministers you know these, these sorts of things and i think that you know copenhagen even has a uh, program called environmentally friendly vikings or something like that so there's very much a an overarching you know country and national approach to these things but you can't be too nationalistic because you see that it can be a hinder, you know, to make to making this happen. So we can't think that we're doing better than everybody else and we have nothing to learn. So, but it, it, it is definitely um, an element in this, I, w I would say that. Thank you. Uh, we also have another question from uh, Kaisa Nilsson. Uh, she wrote, very interesting to hear how these big organizations view sustainability, having it as a core part of their business for decades. What advice can Josephine and Ulrike give to organizations that does not have such a clear connection between core business and sustainability? How does one start turning the ship without using the argument that sustainability is profitable? So who wants to go first? <laughs> Josephine? Yeah. Um, showing examples. I know that you shouldn't say threatening, but I sometimes use both the carrot and the stick. That's what I use. And today, if you don't do these things, you can actually lose sales. Uh, if you are, we had problems when we had the forest company with Greenpeace a couple of years ago. And we needed to, to really do things and talk to them and so on. If not, it could really have an impact on sales. So I think you need to show both sides. The good things and why it can really help them. But also today, and you have excellent examples today with all the activists out there in media. And also showing what investors are asking for today. That's my advice. Uh, and then have them joining in some project because it's a, it's fantastic to work with this it's really fruitful that's my advice 
Maybe I can pick up on that, actually asking the investors. Um, uh, I, I think it's very important to ask yeah, investors, customers, different stakeholders, what, uh, you know, what they feel uh, we should report on. If, if you think of a sustainability report, which is called the materiality assessment that companies should do on a regular basis, uh, but really find out what, uh, what they feel is valuable uh, to, to, to do on the sustainability side. And then I think it's, I think every company can contribute to the 17 SDGs. There is something you can contribute to. And uh, you need to differentiate between things that you can do as a company itself and something that you can do through your business. So for instance, we've got uh, one of our KPIs is to become climate, climate um, positive uh, uh, within the next five years. Um, uh, so that is something that you can do, you know, based on the buildings that you have, the car fleet, uh, you know, everything that has to do with you. But then the other thing we have as a KPI is the percentage of projects supporting decarbonization. And that then is very linked to your customers. So 17 goals, there are so many things you can do. Nobody can tell me that it's not possible. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we have a few more questions and we have a few minutes left. So I will move on to the next question from Julie Holtet Svensson. Do you know why the focus of sustainable development and social, responsible, social responsibility is so low between 2012 and 2019 within strategic issues of communication management? Well, we have seen these figures uh, go up and down. Do you want to pick up on that, Peggy? Yeah, I, I think that um, it, it, it appears to be that it becomes important when there's a crisis. And it's all of a sudden that, oh, we need to be doing this. And of course, that's the absolutely wrong way to think. And I think it, this, this year has shown us that, you know, something just came right out of the blue and just decimated, you know, society over the whole world. And, Nobody could plan for this, even though it was a remote you know, possibility. Who can plan for something like that? And you know, you really we saw the the dips with the um, financial crisis, and then we saw Greta Thunberg. You know, I sort of credit her with bringing it back up. You know, originally, but I think, like you said, next year it's going to be even higher. You know, on on that uh, graph and. So what, what happened is these companies all of a sudden became very, very um, sensitive to what is happening in society. And their bad behavior became much more evident, particularly how they treated people, how they treated their employees, you know, et, et cetera, compounded with the current political environment in one country in particular. And uh, yeah, so my hope, and I believe we've learned our lesson, that this is something that will continue to be important and will become more important. Hmm. Yeah, I really agree with that. And uh, I think it's also influenced a little bit what, how we perceive these strategic issues, but what is going around in the world uh, about you? And now during the past few years, there have been so much focus on this issue. So I think that's one explanation to why they have ranked higher now than before. Um, and we have also a question from Rickard Lindberg. How about transparency in communication connected to sustainability? Are you using relative and absolute numbers in communication? Are all scope one, two, three openly communicated? So I think that's maybe a question for Ulrike and Josephine. You want to start uh, answering that, Ulrike? Yeah, so numbers, uh, I assume uh, it relates to numbers. Um, uh, or impact that we can make. Uh, uh, well, in terms of numbers, we, for instance, give examples on what kind of impact we can make. We can say by, you know, having helped 3,000 vessel owners to change their, you know, uh, um, their propulsion, uh, their, sorry, their, their, the way they uh, uh, handle CO2, you know, allows us to um, save 18 million ton um, um, CO2 every year. So we do try to do that, um, but maybe not to the extent we could. Mm. Uh, Josephine, yeah? Yes, and hi. Yes, we are showing uh, we have sustainability targets and we are also 
They are also linked. Uh, I will do this, and you will have it in, in the brochure that you will get. And we are reporting them once a year in our sustainability and annual report. And they're also based on the science-based target scope one and two and three. So yes, we're doing that, and uh, then you can always do more. <laughs> But this is, a, this is a very good start. This is a very good start. And, and some, which I guess also you, Ulrike, some, it's like, yeah, five years. It's a long time, but today, but we will get there. We will get there, and I'm sure you will get there too. Thank you for those answers. And I can just add that uh, you are way ahead of my own organization, uh, the Higher Education Institution. Uh, we are not obliged to report this sustainability reporting, but I am also a sustainability coordinator at my university, so I'm working to forward these issues and questions within my own organization. So we can all help push this communication about this. Uh, we have one last question, maybe that will be final because we just have a few minutes left. Lars Haug asks, um, uh, anyone that can give an example of normative internal campaigns to strengthen the walk the talk effect? Yes, but maybe I feel a little bit we are a hydrogen health company, so it's, it's maybe easier. Yeah, we have done, of course, hand washing. That's also core to our business. Um, and we developed an application some years ago, which actually it's an app for children learning hand washing. So we did campaigns with that. We had campaigns also asking for volunteers, wanting to educate, and in Mexico, where we go and educate in schools. And then we do campaigns there. So we're doing a lot of internal campaigns, which actually improves the motivation very much. And people get very proud. But I feel a little bit because it's very linked to what we do, of course. Maybe to add to that, I think what is incredibly important is that it's, the, there's a walk, uh, the talk by the management so that the CEO really stands for it and the management team and that it's built into their communication and really feels that it comes from their heart. Uh, what I wanted to add there as well is that I don't think that everybody needs to throw around with the word, uh, you know, sustainability. It could sound too much 2019 now, yeah? Uh, but it's about making an impact. So I think that, uh, especially with Gen Z that I referred to earlier, uh, the, the importance of making an impact in the world uh, is, is something that you know attracts everyone. So maybe something to recommend. Can I add one thing? Can I add one thing? Yes. Very yes. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you can use what we've been doing, and that's been very much appreciated, that we have our own employees that talk and we use them as examples. So when we actually implemented and had the face mask, we had the plant manager who spoke about how he passionately was there, how he developed. And we made a very simple, you know, film with our camera like this both internally and externally. Uh, he was very proud and then externally people liked it and internally people feel really proud. So that's also, if you can find projects where you can have your own employees, that really helps, both internally and externally. Thank you, Josephine. I think we need to wrap up. Uh, Peggy, uh, we'll leave over to you. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for today, taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules. I, I, I know how busy they are, and I really appreciate it. You know, Katrina and I both appreciate it. We thank you, the participants, uh, for spending your morning or lunch with us. I wish you all a good weekend. We have some more webinars coming up, one in uh, September 18th on ethics and the ethical blindness of communication people. So that should be kind of interesting. But I just want to wish everybody a good weekend and stay safe wherever you are in, in the world today. And we hope to see you again next month. <laughs>